thank you. Uh, thank you for that kind introduction, and um, thank you for everyone who is here so bright and early on a Saturday morning. Um, I'm afraid that I'm the bearer of bad news, um, so we're going to start this Saturday morning off with um, some rather um, unpleasant reflections on where things have gone uh, for the past few years and where things are likely uh, to go. The major consequence of the Supreme Court's Obergefell decision redefining marriage in all 50 states um, will be to marriage itself. The major consequence to the government redefining what a natural institution of civil society marriage is will be to future generations of husbands and wives and of children. It'll be to future generations how they understand what marriage is and what marriage requires. I want to talk first today, though, about the secondary consequence of the Obergefell decision. The secondary consequence, which will happen much more immediately, uh, it won't be what happens to your children and your grandchildren, how they understand marriage, how they live out marriage. It'll be happening to you, to your charities, to your churches, to your schools, to your businesses. These will be the consequences to religious liberty and the rights of conscience. Um, because what we've seen even before the Supreme Court announced its decision, we saw a pivot uh, from the activists on the LGBT left. Uh, they issued a report titled Beyond Marriage Equality. Uh, this was back two Decembers ago. They had assumed that they were going to win at the Supreme Court and they wanted to go beyond what they called marriage equality and they wanted to modify every federal anti-discrimination law uh, that prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, and they wanted to add the phrase sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, that acronym SOGI is the cause of many of the religious liberty disputes that I'll be discussing this morning. And that's been their big ask uh, from this current Congress, and they've been working in many state houses and in city halls throughout the nation to get these policies enacted at the local, the state, and the federal level. So first, there was a pivot to eliminating dissent. And if you believe the truth about marriage, that it's the union of a man and a woman, um, some activists on the left will come after you in a variety of ways. And then second, they pivoted to the T. Um, after achieving success on the LGB part of the LGBT acronym, it seemed like overnight the T was now a primetime dinner conversation, and was now orthodoxy uh, within a certain political party. Uh, no longer was this the type of issue that reasonable people needed to have time to discuss and deliberate about. It was now orthodoxy uh, within one of the major parties. So let me start by going through just some of the problems that we've already seen and that we're likely to see. Uh, in the past several years, we've seen Christian charities, uh, particularly uh, uh, adoption agencies, forced to shut down forced to get out of the adoption space because they believe children deserve both a mother and a father. And the government said, no, you're now discriminating on the basis of sexual orientation against same-sex married couples. And unless you place orphaned children with married moms and moms and dads and dads on the same exact basis as you do with married mothers and fathers, you're violating our sexual orientation non-discrimination ordinance, and we won't give you a license to run an adoption agency unless you abide by this government regulation. Uh, so the first place where this took place was Boston. Uh, Boston Catholic Charities Adoption Agencies was forced to stop taking care of these needy children. They had the best track record in the state of Massachusetts, helping to place the hardest to place children into loving homes. Lots of people want to adopt newborn babies. They're cute and they're cuddly. Not as many people want to adopt 11-year-old boys with behavioral problems. And yet Catholic Charities was able to get more families to be more generous, to open their hearts and their homes to more children. Chalk that up either to grace or to Catholic guilt. But one way or the other, the Catholic agency was more successful than the government-run agency. And you only have to imagine what your experience is like at the DMV when you renew your driver's license. And you might be able to understand why a family would want the option of going to the Catholic adoption agency rather than the DMV of Child Protective Services. And yet in Massachusetts, in Illinois, in San Francisco, and in Washington, D.C., where I have to live, um, the government has told these religious agencies they can no longer operate their charity according to their beliefs about what's in the best interest of needy children. This does nothing to help the kids, does nothing to help women who face unplanned pregnancies, who want the option of placing their child up for adoption with a 
faith-based agency that's going to help that child find a loving family according to their values. All it does is score a point for political correctness. Shutting down adoption agencies helps no one except a radical liberal agenda on LGBT issues. We've then seen the same thing take place uh, with schools. Uh, an evangelical school outside of Boston, Gordon College, spent the past year being investigated by their accrediting agency as to whether or not they would remain an accredited four-year liberal arts college because they have a campus policy that says we expect chastity from all students. That every student, every member of the Gordon community is expected to live by the Christian virtue of chastity. They're an evangelical school. It's not an unreasonable expectation. It's my understanding that CCU has a similar campus policy, so it's only a matter of time before the accrediting agency comes knocking on your door. Uh, thankfully, the president of Gordon College fought this, and he fought it very uh, prudently and strategically, and he got the accrediting agency to back down for now. Uh, the letter that they issued at the end of their year-long investigation said, at this time, the accrediting agency see no reason to revoke their accreditation. Uh, but the American Bar Association this year announced that it was investigating Brigham Young University's law school. Um, they have a similar policy, and someone had complained saying that the ABA should remove the Bar Association's accreditation of BYU's law school because they, quote, discriminate against uh, gays and lesbians by having a chastity policy on campus. During oral arguments at the Supreme Court in the case that was mentioned in my introduction, Justice Alito asked the Solicitor General of the United States, what's going to happen to the nonprofit tax status of Christian schools who continue to teach that marriage is the union of a man and a woman and who continue to have campus policies that reflect that truth? And the Solicitor General gave a chilling response. He says, I don't deny it, Justice Alito, that's going to be an issue. I don't deny it, it's going to be an issue. What he could have said was that, of course not, Justice Alito. We'll never treat Christian schools who believe marriage is the union of a man and a woman the way that we treat racist schools who are against interracial marriage. That was the example that Justice Alito had brought up, the Bob Jones University case, where the IRS stripped Bob Jones University of its nonprofit tax status because it had a policy against interracial dating. And Alito said, is the same thing going to happen to hundreds of Christian schools that teach marriage is the union of a man and a woman? What the Solicitor General could have said was, this is nothing like racism, we'd never treat them that way, but he didn't. He held it open so that whether it's the remainder of this administration, or whether it's the next eight years of the next administration, they could play that card if it became an opportune time. So we've had the charities, we've had the schools, and then of course we've had the wedding professionals. The bakers, the florists, the photographers. Here we have people of faith who are living their vocations in the marketplace, trying to run their businesses in accordance with their beliefs, trying to bring glory to God in their occupational vocations. They've had no problem employing gay people. They've had no problem serving gay people. If you want to get a happy birthday cake and you're gay, they have no problem. If you want get well soon flowers, no problem. It was only when they were asked to do same-sex wedding flowers or to bake the same-sex wedding cake that these professionals said, I can't do that. It would force me to violate my conscience. I can't use my God-given artistic gifts and talents to help celebrate what I believe tells a lie about God's institution of marriage. And they've been sued. Um, they've more or less have lost all of these lawsuits thus far. Uh, in one case, there's a 71-year-old grandmother in Washington State who's been sued in both her professional and her personal capacity because she declined to make flowers for a same-sex couple for their wedding even though she had been selling them flowers for a decade. She knew they were a gay couple. She had no problem doing flowers for any other occasion. She just couldn't do the wedding flowers. Even though she's had gay employees work at her floral studio, none of that was good enough. Unless she violated her beliefs about marriage, she couldn't operate in Washington State. And so she's been sued. She's lost the first round of her lawsuit. She's filed an appeal. The reason I mentioned that she's been sued in both her professional and personal capacity is that in the neighboring state of Oregon, you have a young evangelical couple, Aaron and Melissa Klein, that run a bakery. They were sued because they declined to bake a same-sex wedding cake. They were forced to pay $135,000 in fines. They were also forced to shut down their bakery. And the husband now works as a trash collector, supporting his wife and their four children, making half what they used to make when they were entrepreneurs running a small bakery. So whether you're a fiscal conservative or a social conservative, whether you're a libertarian, whether you 
are a devout believer, everyone should have an interest in making sure that whatever you think about marriage, people are free to disagree, free to lead their lives in accordance with their beliefs about marriage, free to make their way in the marketplace according to their beliefs, free to run their schools in accordance with their beliefs, not the government's beliefs, free to run their charities in accordance with their beliefs, not the government's beliefs. And yet this isn't happening on this question. And so it raises the issue of why. And so I want to suggest that if you turn back the clock to 1973, shortly after Roe v. Wade, uh, we were in a similar cultural moment. The Supreme Court had just struck down laws in all 50 states that protected unborn human life. There were activists on the left who said every hospital and every doctor and every nurse should have to perform abortions. And the activists lost. In that cultural situation, pro-lifers were able to make common cause with reasonable pro-choicers to say if the Supreme Court has just created a constitutional right for a woman to choose to have an abortion, Congress needs to protect the right for a pro-life doctor and nurse to choose not to perform an abortion. That choice would need to be a two-way street on this question. And so in June of 1973, the Church Amendment was passed by Congress. The Church Amendment's not named for stone buildings with stained glass windows and steeples. It's named for the Democratic Senator from Idaho, Frank Church. And what Senator Church said, he said, we're gonna make sure that the federal government never penalizes a Catholic hospital or an evangelical doctor or a Mormon nurse because they believe in the sanctity of life and therefore they refuse to participate in abortion. It's what has made it possible 43 years later, for evangelicals and Catholics and Mormons and other pro-life Americans to be active in the medical professions. There was an attempt to force these people out of the medical professions to make the, an abortion litmus test, and the activists lost. The question now is, will the activists win or lose as they try to force people who believe the truth about marriage, that it's a union of man and woman, out of certain professions, out of certain charitable spaces, out of certain educational opportunities. And they can do this through your licensing, through your tax status, through your accreditation, through government grants and contracts and loans. There's a variety of mechanisms in which they can impose their ideology on sexual matters and say, if you don't agree with the government's point of view, you're gonna be marginalized. So why is it that pro-lifers were successful where thus far people who believe that marriage is a union of husband and wife have been unsuccessful. I think here it's a matter of um, your average secular liberal, do they view you if you believe marriage is the union of a man and a woman the way they view pro-lifers or do they view you the way that they view racist bigots? And here's what I mean. I was an undergraduate at Princeton. My average classmate disagreed with me about abortion. They were pro-choice, I was pro-life. But my average classmate thought I was reasonable. They at least understood why I believed that the unborn child had a right to life. And because they thought I was reasonable, they were less willing to coerce me, less willing to penalize me, less willing to demonize me. My average classmate at Princeton, uh, despite the best of my efforts for the past several years, does not understand why I believe what I believe about marriage. Uh, they think I'm an idiot. They think I'm dangerous. They think I'm evil. They think I'm responsible for the Orlando shooting. That's the way that a secular liberal who's never gone to church, who's never read the Bible, thinks Christians um, believe about marriage. And we're somewhat to blame for this uh, because what they know about marriage is what they've heard from the Westboro Baptist Church. If all you have ever heard about Christianity and marriage is God hates fags, the Westboro Baptist Church sign that they hold up when they protest funerals, what are you likely to believe about Christians and about same-sex marriage? You're likely to say these people are evil, these people are stupid, these people are responsible for great harm in our country, and these people must be stopped. So the challenge now for us is to say, what can we do to reach out to reasonable people on the left, people who might disagree with us about the definition of marriage, to say that this is an issue on which reasonable people can disagree, and that Mer America is a big enough country to have space for both of us, that we can agree to disagree on this question, and that the baker should be free to bake a same-sex marriage cake if they want to, but should also be free to not be forced to bake a same-sex marriage cake. 
that liberal religious schools should be free to promote same-sex marriage, but conservative religious schools should be free not to have to. Um, so if you belong to any liberal church, you can do what you want to do in revisionist theology, but if you belong to a traditionalist church, orthodoxy shouldn't now be discriminated against by the government. If your charity wants to be doing LGBT adoptions and you want to have transgender bathrooms, you can be free to do that, but if you don't want to be forced to do that, the government shouldn't be coercing you. Let me go one step deeper as to why these challenges now. And I think this will tie in nicely with some of the other talks um, at this weekend's uh, summit. I wanna say there have been three changes in American culture uh, in the past 50 years or so that explain why the pro-lifers had success where pro-marriage people have not. And it'll help, I think, to give us a roadmap on what we need to do as conservative intellectuals, conservative activists, uh, conservative movement leaders, here are three changes that need to be responded to. And it explains why we're having these challenges now. The first is that we've had a change in religion. Um, we've had two changes in religion, one from without and one from within. The change from without is the rise of secularism. That's what my former boss, Richard John Newhouse, called the naked public square. Uh, we've seen in the past 40, 50 years that religious voices are no longer welcome in the public square. The assumption is that religion is just something that you do privately inside the four walls of your house, inside the four walls of your chapel, that it has no bearing on public life. And therefore, you can't bring your values uh, to the public square. This has also resulted in the free exercise of religion being redefined as the freedom of worship. If religion is simply what you do inside the four walls of your home, the four walls of your chapel, then it's just freedom of worship, and even the nuns don't deserve to be protected in the context of the HHS mandate, right? So if religion doesn't include taking care of the sick, the poor, and the elderly, the way that the little sisters of the poor do, they're protected inside of their chapel, they're protected inside of their homes, they're not protected when they run a nursing home or a hospice center. That's the current position of the Obama administration. But of course, it hasn't just been a change from outside of religious communities. There's been a change inside of American religion itself. And I think the best book on this is Ross Douthat's Bad Religion. Um, from within the Protestant side of the line, you've seen that the mainline churches became the old line churches, and now they're the sideline churches. We've had the collapse of the mainline churches. We've then seen a new generation of evangelicals who are somewhat um, hesitant to step into the public square. Uh, they want to be liked, they want to be socially acceptable, so they're less willing to engage in these public issues. On the Catholic side of the aisle, uh, we've seen uh, what could be called the spirit of Vatican II, uh, the fracturing of the Catholic Church after the Second Vatican Council between kind of liberal Catholics and John Paul II Catholics. So even within religious communities themselves, these issues have been fracturing the church. The result is what the Notre Dame sociologist Christian Smith calls moralistic therapeutic deism. Right? It's an understanding of which probably many of your children and grandchildren just think that there's a kind of God in, up in the sky. He mainly just wants us to be nice people and he's there for when we need him to help us. But he's not a God that places demands on us. He's not a God that holds us to standards. And so when Newman said that conscience has rights because conscience has duties, it's much harder to explain the duties of conscience. And if you don't understand the concept of duties, it's not surprising that we have a generation that's not taking conscience rights very seriously. The second change, though, is the growth of the state. Um, if James Madison or Thomas Jefferson were around today, and they heard about the baker, the florist, the photographer, if they heard about the little sisters of the poor, the first thing they said wouldn't be First Amendment to the Constitution, it wouldn't be religious liberty, the first thing they would say is, what authorizes the Secretary of Health and Human Services to say that every health care plan in America has to cover 20 FDA-approved abortion-causing drugs and devices? That would be their first question. Their next question would be, what is the FDA and what is the Department of Health and Human Services? That would be the second question. And then the third question would be, 
And why is it that Congress never even voted on these issues? Why is it that an unelected bureaucrat could just issue a mandate and then force the nuns to spend five years in court trying to recover their rights? What we've seen in the past 50 years is a growth of government, more regulation. And as you have the government regulating more aspects of our lives, it's more likely that it violates our rights, including our religious liberty rights. At one point in the United States, we had a presumption of freedom, and the presumption was that we are free to do what we want to do, and government has to justify why it's burdening our freedom. Today, we see a presumption of government activity, and then we have to defend why we should be left free. The presumption is that the HHS mandate is a good thing. The nuns need to prove why they deserve to be exempted from it. It's turned the nature of the relationship between the citizen and the state upside down. And then lastly, we've had a change in sexuality. Um, it's not surprising that today all of the religious liberty cases that are controversial involve sex in one way or another. They're about pharmacists having to dispense morning after pills in Washington state. They're about nuns having to pay for abortion causing drugs and devices. They're about bakers and florists and photographers having to help celebrate same sex weddings. So whether it's contraception or abortion, or same-sex marriage, one after another, these are what these issues today seem to be hinging on. If you put these together, the ACLU isn't against religious liberty when it means a Muslim inmate gets to grow a half-inch beard. The ACLU is not against religious liberty when it means that the Amish get to homeschool their children. The ACLU is not against religious liberty when it means Native Americans get to ingest peyote. The ACLU is against religious liberty when it means a conservative Christian might get to not have to dispense the morning after pill or not have to pay for abortion or not have to help celebrate a same-sex wedding. All of those issues where the ACLU has now flip-flopped. They once were in favor of religious liberty. They saw the free exercise of religion as a civil liberty, and they're the American Civil Liberties Union. They're now against it because it puts them on the wrong side of their under, other agenda, the sexual revolution agenda. So in the time I have left, I want to say a couple of things of what we need to do in response. Uh, we have to respond to the changes in religion. And that's one of the things that Colorado Christian University, the, the sponsor of this summit, is working on. We have various groups trying to uh, rebuild and restore orthodoxy in the United States. We have to respond to the growth of the government. Uh, the organization that I work for, the Heritage Foundation, that's what we try to do day in and day out, is to put a, uh, a some limits on what the state is doing. We have to respond to the sexual revolution. This is where groups like the Love and Fidelity Network and the Ruth Institute are trying to show what a more humane understanding of human sexuality looks like. But I want to mention two things in particular. Uh, one is that we need to be more political, not less political. There's a certain temptation right now among conservative uh, Christians in the United States that we should disengage from politics. Um, that because uh, we've had this series of setbacks, uh, what we should be doing is just focusing on our own communities and not participating in the democratic process. I think here this is getting it exactly backwards. If anything, we need to become more engaged in the political process, and we need to become more engaged in a more strategic way. To the best of my understanding, there is no national C4 or Super PAC or 527 engaged in the religious liberty debate. The people who are defending religious liberty tend to be at C3s. They tend to be at public interest law firms like the Beckett Fund and the Alliance Defending Freedom. They tend to be pastors. And so what we have are a bunch of non-political operators trying to win a political fight in addition to a cultural and legal fight. So we have the cultural part, we have the pastors involved, we have the think tankers involved, we have the legal part, we have the lawyers involved. We don't have anyone who can engage in direct political action. Look at all of the other special interest groups. They have C4s, they have 527s, they have super PACs. They don't just ask you to do the right thing. They say if you do the wrong thing, we're gonna make you pay consequences. Conservatives, social conservatives in particular, need to get involved in politics in that sort of a way. And then lastly, we can't just retreat to religious liberty. Um, the religious liberty battle, whether it's on transgender bathrooms, whether it's on same-sex marriage, whether it's now being relitigated on the abortion issue, will be won or lost depending on whether or not we're willing to defend the substance of the beliefs 
that we seek the freedom to live out. Um, saying, leave me alone to be a bigot is not a winning strategy. Because what we believe on these issues isn't bigotry. What we believe on these issues is the truth. And so unless we're willing to make public arguments And so I'll just close by saying, unless we're willing to make public arguments in the public square in defense of the truth, we have no reason to think that we'll have the freedom to live by the truth in years to come. Thank you.